Welcome back. So now I'm going to show you one of the most useful uh, properties of the fast Fourier transform, which is that you can use it to compute very accurate derivatives of clean data. Okay, so we're going to talk about the FFT and derivatives. And we've already seen before that the regular Fourier transform, kind of the, the analytic Fourier transform, can be used to compute the derivatives of functions. Here we're going to show that the fast Fourier transform can be used to approximate derivatives from discretely sampled data. Okay? So in this example, we're going to start with a function where we actually know what the answer is. So this, our function is going to be cosine x times e to the minus x squared over 25. So it's basically a cosine function in a Gaussian decaying envelope. Okay? And what I'm going to do is I, I know the analytic derivative uh, df, so I just computed this using uh, the chain rule. So this is the true derivative. And what we're going to do is we're going to approximate the derivative using a finite difference derivative, just kind of a, a forward difference scheme. So the next point minus the last point divided by delta x. Uh, and then I'm going to approximate the derivative using the fast Fourier transform. And we're going to see that the fast Fourier transform derivative is much, much more accurate than finite difference. Now, this is a very, very crude demonstration. Uh, the first thing you might be saying is, well, I know lots better finite difference schemes. You could use central difference. You could use higher order accurate schemes that use more, uh, more points. That's absolutely true. Uh, but what we're going to find is that the fast Fourier transform is going to be kind of the best uh, you can do on clean data uh, in terms of the derivative. Okay, so this is just meant to be an illustration comparing the fast Fourier transform derivative with the, the finite difference derivative. Okay, so I have a, a true function f defined on some interval, I think from um, minus 15 to 15, so length 30. There's 128 data points, so pretty coarse. Uh, and I know my analytic derivative df, so I'm gonna compare with that, okay? So the uh, finite difference derivative is simple. It's just um, kind of f, uh, we're approximating f prime is approximately, this is at index k, is approximately f at index k plus 1 minus fk divided by delta x. That's about as crude of a, an approximation as you can get to the derivative. Finite difference, um, order delta x. Uh, the, the error is going to be order delta x. Okay, but with our fast Fourier transform, it's also very easy to compute the derivative. So remember, if I have the Fourier transform of the derivative of my function with respect to x, this is equal to, um, now sometimes I write this as i times omega Fourier transform, but when I Fourier transform with respect to space, sometimes I use kappa. So I'm just gonna make a little note down here Kappa is usually for space, uh, spatial frequencies. And omega I'm going to usually use for temporal um, frequencies. And they're basically the same thing. They're just uh, Fourier variables. But if I Fourier transform a function of space, I'm often going to call uh, the Fourier variable kappa, which is a spatial frequency or a wave number. We call it a wave number a lot. Whereas if I take a function of time and I Fourier transform it, then my Fourier variable is going to be omega, and that's going to be a temporal frequency. So I'm just going to, here I'm using kappa. It's, it's often common to use kappa. Okay, good. So my Fourier transform of a derivative is just i times kappa, or i times omega if it's a time function, times uh, the Fourier transform of f, which is just f hat. Okay, so instead of computing the derivative, I can just compute the Fourier transform and multiply that by i times kappa. Okay, now the catch here is that in the discrete or fast Fourier transform, this is a vector of Fourier coefficients. So I have to multiply each element by that corresponding frequency. So this is actually a vector uh, of spatial frequencies, and this is a vector of Fourier coefficients, and I have to multiply them element-wise to get a new vector, um, essentially, you know, kappa 1, f1 hat, kappa 2, f2 hat, and so on and so forth, um, all of this times i, 
So that's how I'm defining this, this uh, derivative using the discrete Fourier transform. I, I compute a vector of frequencies, kappa. I have my vector of Fourier transform coefficients, f hat, and I kind of dot multiply them element-wise uh, to get this, this new vector of my derivatives. And if I inverse Fourier transform this quantity, when I inverse Fourier transform, I'll recover my derivative df dx. And what we're gonna find is that this is actually very, very accurate, okay? So that's all we're doing here, is I'm creating a big vector of frequencies in kappa, um, and this is kind of um, a MATLAB trick, a couple of lines you need to know in MATLAB, is that if you define your fundamental frequency as two pi divided by L, and you can have kind of low frequencies and high frequencies, there's a whole vector of frequencies, you have to do this FFT shift command in MATLAB, which basically reorders this kappa vector to be consistent with its internal FFT ordering of the frequencies. I think this is kind of a mess. Every language orders frequencies differently, like C++ orders them one way, Python, you know, and MATLAB will order them differently. And so in MATLAB, this is just, I remember this, these two lines of code, you can just copy and paste this. This creates your vector of frequencies, and this shifts them, this reorders them to be consistent with MATLAB's FFT. That creates this kappa vector of frequencies, so that each frequency, um, each element of f has its corresponding frequency that it, that it corresponds to. And now the derivative is really easy. You just take i times kappa times f hat, and notice this is a dot times, which does this element-wise multiplication. And then finally, all I have to do is inverse Fourier transform that, and I recover my derivative in real spatial units. And I'm taking the real part because since these are complex numbers uh, in the Fourier transform, small machine precision errors can cause the inverse Fourier transform to be complex, and so you kill any imaginary components. Okay? Pretty simple um, in MATLAB. The, the trick is that it's fast to compute this FFT. It's really easy to make these vectors of frequencies and it's easy to compute this derivative and inverse Fourier transform, okay? So I'm gonna run all of this code. Uh, I'm gonna run, compute my, my data F and its analytic derivative. I'm gonna compute this using um, finite differences uh, in MATLAB, that's gonna be my benchmark. I'm gonna compute the fast Fourier transform version of the derivative, and then down here I'm gonna plot everything, okay? And so this is a plot. Uh, in white, we have the true derivative uh, of this you know, Gaussian envelope uh, cosine function. In yellow, we have the finite difference uh, scheme, and in red, we have our FFT derivative. It's a little hard to see here because it's actually all doing pretty, pretty good with this resolution. Um, on my screen, I can see that the finite difference is, is definitely off, and the red curves and white curves are perfectly overlaying. But what I'm gonna do is I'm going to exaggerate this point by making my data coarser. So instead of 128 points, I'm gonna have 64 points. So I'm gonna have a coarser, a bigger delta x, okay? And when I do this, we should see a more uh, dramatic change in performance. So now we can actually see that there's a pretty dramatic uh, difference between the finite difference is quite off. It's, it's off at all points. Uh, but the red FFT derivative is almost perfectly aligned with the true derivative. Okay, and I might even zoom in a little to show you this better. So even when you zoom in, you see that the white curve, which is our analytic derivative, is almost perfectly aligned with the FFT derivative, even when the finite difference is off. So even if I coarsen the data considerably, the FFT derivative stays quite accurate. Okay, so that's really nice uh, property of the FFT. Okay, good. Now this wasn't meant to be really quantitative or exhaustive. Sure, you could come up with better finite difference schemes. You could make delta x smaller. You could do all kinds of things. Um, we do talk about this in the book, so you can kind of check this out. Um, let me find it real quick. Um, here it is. So we do talk about this in the book, uh, where what I do is I actually carefully go through and compute the finite difference derivative and the spectral or FFT derivative as I increase the number of points n, which corresponds to decreasing delta x. So we know that our finite difference is gonna get better when I make my delta x smaller and smaller and smaller, but how much better does it get how fast? Okay, so that's what this plot shows, is the error in a log plot versus how many data points I have. 
Okay, and so you're absolutely right. As I increase the number of data points, my, my finite difference does get more accurate because delta x is getting smaller, but it gets more accurate very, very slowly, whereas the spectral derivative, when I increase my data points, it gets much, much, much better, much, much faster, okay? So this is, um, is kind of spectral convergence. That's what we call this is spectral convergence. It's much better than a finite difference scheme. In fact, it's better than any finite difference scheme. Um, you know, even if I did central difference or higher order, that would bring these down. But the spectral derivative is kind of, um, you know, outperforming all of these. So this is a nice, in fact, I would encourage you to try to write this code yourself. It's really not that hard. You just wrap a for loop around this whole thing, making n larger and larger and larger, and then you can make these plots yourself. You can try different uh, derivative schemes uh, and really convince yourself that the spectral derivative is, is uh, you know, much more accurate, at least on clean data. Okay. The other thing I want to point out, and this is in also in chapter two of our book, is um, you do have to be careful when you're computing the derivative of functions, even if the, your function f is continuous, like this function, our, our triangular hat function we looked at earlier. The derivative of this triangular hat function is discontinuous. I have zero, then the derivative immediately becomes one, then it immediately becomes negative one, and then it goes back to zero. So there's these jump discontinuities. And when I use the spectral derivative, uh, the f of t, to compute the derivative of this function, because the derivative is discontinuous, I'm going to get these Gibbs phenomena uh, that, I, that I saw before. Okay, So you still can get Gibbs phenomena if you're taking the derivative of a function where the derivative is discontinuous. Okay, so you have to be careful, and if you see this, now you'll know what you're looking at. You're looking at these Gibbs phenomena because your derivative function is discontinuous. Okay, so long story short, we can use the FFT to very, very accurately uh, and rapidly approximate derivatives of vectors of data, and we're going to be able to use this to solve partial differential equations. Okay, thank you.